Well, when I came here, I was um, 12 and a half years old, um, and they put me in sixth grade. Uh, in the American school, they were doing adding and subtraction. We were already doing equations. So, uh, but I couldn't tell them because I only spoke German. Uh, not a word of English. Um, when I went to school in Germany, they taught Latin and French. So my English was non-existent. Um, and the first thing that happened is um, uh, I wore Zeppelhosen, meaning short pants that they wear in Germany, and immediately uh, was qualified as a Nazi because we wore these short pants. And I wasn't going to go to school anymore. And the one thing is I, we bought a pair of long pants, and that was my heaven to uh, not be called a Nazi. Uh, because the kids didn't know, and uh, I couldn't tell them because I didn't speak a word of English, but they put me in uh, sixth grade. And um, we did, as I said, arithmetic, but we had done equations. So once they discovered that I, too, that I was far ahead of just simple uh, addition, they put me in eighth grade. I still didn't talk much English, but they put me in eighth grade. And um, then they put me <laughs> in what they called rapid advance classes, where they combined the A and Bs, uh, in other words, uh, two semesters in one. And um, uh, so at 13, I, um, I was ready to get out of the school that I was in, the grade school. And then came an interesting situation. Um, in, in, uh, we lived in New York, um, and um, uh, they had a school called Stuyvesant High School for which you had to take an entrance exam. Um, it was a uh, school to t teach uh, mathematics, physics, and chemistry, prepare you for an engineering school. Uh, so it's two days of testing. Uh, one day was English, <laughs> and the second day was um, physics and math. And they came back to the school that I was attending, and they said, there's something wrong with this kid. Um, because he scored in the 90 percentile in the science and almost English, and almost zero in English. <laughs> and they said, the stupid head, he doesn't speak English. So they gave me a special exam and I was admitted to Stuyvesant High School. Um, as a result of my background of having had French in German, I, um, we had in, in New York what they call regents, that you had to take every year a regents exam that was statewide. <clears throat> and I took the, went into high school and um, took German and French, immediately got credit for four years of uh, regents. And I graduated uh, high school uh, short of being 16, because we were so far ahead in, in school. And of course, by this time, I had a basic uh, understanding of uh, uh, German and English. Mr. Slayton, maybe you want to take them back to where you were born That's and what it was like yeah, yeah. growing up. Yeah. I. Um, I was raised, born and raised in a town called Zerbst, Germany. It's about 50 or 60 miles um, southeast of Berlin. A small town, about 25,000 people. It did have a gymnasium, which is 
co combination of high school and junior college. Um, by the way, that was uh, a building that was done in the 16th, 15th or 16th century. That was our school. Um, and um, uh, everything went quite well. Um, we had, um, my father had uh, three stores. Um, the, the town, uh, we had a synagogue, small synagogue for a town of 20,000 people. And then in 1933, Hitler came to power. And uh, uh, he uh, said that the Jews were to blame for Germany's inflation and poverty. But he didn't do much in 33. He um, made an exit for those that were not born in Germany. That was uh, <coughs> refugees that came from Russia and uh, Poland to live in Germany. They were uh, asked to leave. And they, as it turned out, they were lucky ones because uh, they did, weren't around for the concentration camp. So our business thrived um, despite the Hitler and the anti-Semitism. Um, we had three stores and um, nothing really extraordinary except that the anti-Semitism was getting louder and more provocative. Then in 1937, uh, my mother and father decided to take a trip to Palestine. It was called Palestine, not Israel, uh, to see if they could immigrate to um, Palestine. <clears throat> they took a week trip, but uh, you remember that the Palestine was controlled by the English mandate, and they would not allow any more Jews into Palestine at that point. So. Uh, they came back in 37 from the trip and uh, when they came after, one day after they arrived back uh, the police department called um, if my father would go uh, to the police department they want to check his passport so my mother said have a cup of coffee and he says, it's next door, I'll be right back. He didn't come back. You can imagine my mother. Uh, uh, there was no, you couldn't get lawyers. It, it, it was impossible uh, because the Gestapo had taken over. So they kept my father. And during the night, when he was in, incarcerated, um, the chief of police came by <laughs> and he said to my father, Max, what are you doing in here? And he says, I always come here from my vacation. <laughs> and he said, it's not funny. You have to leave. I'm going to let you leave and you go home, you get your kids and your wife and you leave this town that you're in and you're out of town period. So he came back, and that night, we went in the car and drove to Berlin to a cousin's house in Berlin. Now comes the interesting thing. Um, my father said, I'm not staying in this country. Um, this, this is, oh, the, the reason that they asked him to come to the police station, they wanted to know if he had transferred Goldmark, the, the Germans had marks, regular currency, and Goldmark, which were backed by gold. And they, um, they wanted to know if he had transferred any Goldmark to uh, outside the country, which was punishable by death. And uh, he had not transferred a penny. Uh, so anyway, uh, th this is in late 19... 37, uh, we packed up whatever we could and we went to Berlin to see, to live with a cousin. And the cousin said, Max, this is, this is gonna pass. 
um, Hitler's not going to last forever. My father said he may not last forever, but we are certainly on a short s scale here. So we then tried to get <laughs> to every country that you can think of, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, United States. None would have Jews. They were all closed up. So finally, uh, we went to the American Council, and he said, well, you're four of us. It was my brother, my mother, my father, myself, four. Um, you have to have an affidavit that you're not going to be on welfare, that you can support yourself. Um, well, we didn't have anybody. So they said to my father, do you have gold mark? Can you withdraw gold mark, uh, 20,000 gold mark? And my father said yes. And they said, we'll put this in uh, diplomatic mail so when you come to the United States, you have 20,000 gold marks. So that indicates that you're not going to be on welfare. That's how we got our visa. We came on the SS Manhattan, um, landed in April 1938. Of course, we never saw the money again. We got the visa, but the money was gone. Uh, that, uh, but we didn't care because uh, this was our life that was at stake. And we, my father said, the hell with the, with the money. Um, it, it, yeah, um, and um, so anyway, we, we came here, um, I would say penniless. Um, my father, who had three stores, and we had uh, a huge house, and I have a, a layout of the house. We had about 13, 14 room. We were the first with um, uh, installation of hot and cold water, and central heating, and um, uh, we had this huge house. Everything, everything was left uh, when we left the uh, country. Now here was a man uh, in his late 40s when he left. Um, he had three stores. Um, he had to get a job. He got a job <laughs> cutting onions in the, for a restaurant. My mother made him undress at the door because he stunk so bad from onion. So uh, that's, that's how we got started. Um, they put me in sixth grade. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, I couldn't communicate. Uh, so that, the, um, pardon? Being in the clothing business, and yeah. that's how you got out of jail. Uh, well, the, the, the reason the, um, he got out of the custody of the uh, Gestapo was that we made the uniforms for the police in, in, of the state that we were in. Okay, is this better? Okay, um, so that was the police chief and we came here in uh, 38. Now, uh, we have just, this is a very short period. I could go on for days explaining of what we, what we did, um, and by the way, the the cousin that um, said to my father, "Stay here, uh, Hitler won't last forever." Well, he, he he lasted a long time, and he took a lot of Jews with him, and um, we went back to G G German government. Flew Sally and myself back to Germany, and. Uh, you can see this later, but I asked if the Germans had a book of all the Jews that they killed. <laughs> Would you believe it, that they have this? They have a book like this um, with names when they were born, when they were arrested and uh, uh, put in a concentration camp and the day they were killed.
they have this. The book is three volumes. Is sitting in, in the Bürgermeister at the mayor's office in Berlin. But that's amazing that they um, they have it alphabetically listed. Um, when they when they arrested him, arrested the person, when they were born, and the day they were killed. Interesting how Germans kept records. And uh, the, if you want to see, see, look at this. And by the way, the reason we were there so long, um, they ex exempt people, Jews, that were in the previous World War. They, they said they were good citizens for a while until they killed them. And my father was exempt because he was in World War one and received the Iron Cross from Germany <clears throat> uh, for four years of war. He had a brother who was a doctor and also was a um, officer in the German army. So we we came here. Um, I was, as I said, 12 and a half. Um, was bar mitzvah in, in New York, uh, Temple Antioch Hesed. Um, spoke better German still than English, but um, I graduated uh, high school, as I said, at um, short of 16. Um, I went to a University of Wisconsin uh, got a degree in engineering and um, worked for many years, primarily for General Foods, Jell-O, Maxwell House, and um, uh, incidentally, would anybody try to guess how many Jell-O packages are made a year? Anybody? Guess. Go ahead. I, I couldn't hear you. How many? She said 100,000. <laughs> she said 100,000. Yeah, would you believe 100 million? <laughs> uh, packages. Um, so uh, it was a uh, very, uh, uh, General Foods was known for Jell-O, Maxwell House, and uh, many other. And I was, incidentally, <laughs> I was the first Jew that was ever hired by General Foods because they came out of Battle Creek, Michigan, and there were no Jews there. So I wanted them to know they were hiring a Jew. So when they interviewed me, I said, uh, I just want to let you know there are going to be three days in the year that I have to take off. And they said, why is that? And I said, because those are Jewish holidays, and I intend to take those off. And I, they accepted me. And I became division manager of the Jello division, um, a $400 million division. Um, and, um, and later on, I uh, became vice president of United Shoe Machinery that was in packaging. Um, and uh, th that's basically my story in the United States. Now, we, my father <laughs> uh, stopped cutting onions. <laughs> And he went back into men's clothing, worked uh, as a designer and cutter in the men's clothing. My mother, who had two maids in Germany, worked for a company called Rokich, you know, they make, makes kosher products. And um, uh, my brother and I cleaned the house and went to school because that's the way we had to pitch in. And, um, my very first job in, in the United States was working for a kosher butcher and to deliver the kosher butcher, the, 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 the meat of, from the kosher butcher to West End Avenue in New York, which was the wealthy section. And um, <laughs> uh, he would give me, let's say, four packages for that building 
And I said, that become those stories that I can tell you. Um, one more story, uh, they, had a, uh, they came with a placard, don't buy from Jews. So one of the policemen that, for whom we made the uniform came to the back door of the store and said, you know, I, I wanna buy my clothes here, but as you know, I can't come through the front door because the Nazis objected for us to buy from you. My father said, if you can't come through the front door, we don't need you as a customer. So those are the stories that we, we bring with us. Wow. Who would like to ask the first question? Liam? Do you have any, fam have any family members that were killed in the war? I, I couldn't hear. Were there any family members killed in the Holocaust? Oh, yeah. Uh, all of them, uh, on both sides. They li they're listed in this. Uh, the only ones that survived were. Th they're not gonna hear. When we went to the mayor's office and got these three gray books, I was astounded. And I copied the pages, there were 76 names per page, and he told you what was on that sheet of paper and we looked through for all of his relatives and not one of them survived, not one. Next question. You had a lot of questions before. I'm wondering you were talking about the rise of anti-Semitism that you felt after Hitler came in. And I'm wondering what your feelings are now in the United States. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, I, I see a very dangerous time that we're living in because this is how it started in Germany. And it brings back really bad memories. It started, you know, you're a good Jew because you served in the army, but that's a bad Jew, and so forth. And um, I, I really do not like what's going on right now, but hopefully it's a temporary situation. The sooner it ends, the better. My, my opinion. What did you know about, when you were in New York, what, in uh, 1938 and later, uh, what did you know about the Holocaust? Or well, we, we read about Kristallnacht. You know, we were here now about four months um, when it happened. Um, uh, as, as, I, as Sally said, none of our relatives, close relatives, escaped, and we found them in this. You know, it's, it's an amazing situation. Uh, for a country to list specifically the people that they killed with the dates, where, how, it, it's, it, it, it's hard to imagine that, that um, people would be so bestial, not only to kill them, but to record what they did. You know, that, that it's uh, called Deutsche Oertlichkeit, which means uh, they have a way of documenting everything that, and um, Sally asked, uh, do you have a book? And they showed us three volumes of books where they have it, but very specifically, when they killed them, uh, and, and I was, they were proud of the fact what they did. Other questions? Yes. Were you ever taken away? Were you ever taken away? Not, no, I was too young. Um, I was uh, 12 years old. They, but I, I, don't get me wrong, if I had stayed, uh, I would have been killed also. What were your first impressions on everything that was happening about the Holocaust once you heard about it? Well, when he was living there, or? When you first heard about it, like when you first heard about Kristallnacht. 
So what were your first impressions? I mean, you were a young boy when, some, when Hitler was coming to power. Um, did you talk about this at the dinner table? What did your parents say? How, how did you feel? Um, <clears throat> were, did you still have the same friends, those types of things? Yeah, I, well, I, I was, you know, uh, 37, 10 years old when he uh, came to power. Um, and, uh, you know, we went to school and there wasn't any anti-Semitism at that point, but um, uh, the anti-Semitism grew year after year to be much more um, earnest. And, um, you know, <laughs> we had a maid one time and she said, did you know to my father that um, they arrested Mr. So-and-so uh, and he went off to concentrate? We, they couldn't believe this. My father said, you know what today is? It's April 1st. It's full, somebody told you a foolish story. They, 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 we, we, this was the fourth generation of us being in that town and they couldn't believe this, this, that this could happen. Um, we were accepted. Um, you know, we made police uniforms. We knew all the police, but it was so pervasive the anti-Semitism, so pervasive that uh, even the ones that did not believe in Hitler ha had to join him because that was the daily bread that they were eating. Um, I know that Fritz Kolbe, which was a German industrial turned allied spy, was the first person to document that the Germans were uh, committing the Holocaust. But when did you learn about it? Like when did you hear in like the newspapers about it? Maybe you talk about that from the United States because I think what Mr. Slayton is t saying is he lived in it. So he was experience it, experiencing it. Does that make sense, Teddy? Right. So maybe you can talk about what you heard once you were in the United States. You told us you heard about Kristallnacht, but once the United States entered the war, what did you hear well, about the Jews? <clears throat> yeah. I, um, my brother, um, sorry to say, was killed in a war in the, in the United States Army, mm. uh, invading uh, Italy under Patton. So you can imagine, we, we escaped only to have a son being killed. And um, my father and my mother were in deep, deep distress in morning and did not get out of the morning until we I had kids ourselves and that they 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 said these are my kids uh, because this they adopted them uh, not adopted but they they lived like they adopted them because uh, of the loss of my brother Yeah, uh, what was your role, Mr. Slayton? Pardon? Uh, yes. What was your role during the war? Uh, because my brother was uh, killed, uh, I became an interpreter for um, German prisoners. And that was fun for me. That was revenge. That was revenge, because interesting. Okay, last question. Were you scared when you came to the United States? Mm. Were you scared when you came to the United States? <laughs> Not really, except when I told the youngsters in Germany um, that I was going to the United States, they said, you know, when day is here, they're there at night. And I couldn't, I couldn't cope with that, that I was going to be at night during day. Well. It, as it turned out that they were right, but I didn't Im imagine what was going on. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Liam, we'll give you a chance to ask later, okay? 
So, Mr. Slayton, Mrs. Slayton, we thank you so much for sharing your, sto your personal story uh, with our students. Um, you were a witness to that which happened in Germany and how the United States responded. And we are grateful for you sharing your experience with us today.